And welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Tom Fernelli. As you'll notice, I'm not Chip Patterson. Chip, uh, Chip's not here today. He's currently on a flight, I think, to Connecticut because he's abandoned us for college basketball the sob he's turned his back on us but we're still here it's danny and i it's a special mailbag edition danny how are you doing i am great that was a i'll give your chip patterson intro impression (laughs) i'll give it a c plus and i feel like i'm being very generous in that one i don't know if the pitch was quite high enough and the energy definitely did not match where Chip usually brings it, but I I did not. I thought Chip was maybe getting a vacation. I didn't know. Like he does, I should have known better that he wouldn't take a day off to miss the Cover Three Pod. No, Chip. Chip is. Uh, he he had to go to Connecticut. He's filling in this weekend on CBS Sports HQ, which everybody should be watching all weekend long for their March Madness coverage of the NCAA tournament that's going to be going on. And you know, it's it is kind of weird for Chip not to be here. It does feel like kind of like the teacher's gone. Yeah. <laughs> we've got a substitute teacher so there are no rules for today's show we will be covering answering questions mailbag and in the live chat if you have questions you want to submit but first before you do any of that if you haven't done it yet like the video just hit that little button with the thumbs up because it's cool it's an outline but if you click it it fills up and it feels good it changes it's fun and then hit that subscribe button we could always use more subscribers it helps uh it helps fund chips flights to connecticut that's how we pay for Chip. He needs time off. That's why Chip is never is never taking times off and taking vacations because not enough of you subscribe. So if you're not subscribing, it's your fault. So please help Chip out in that area. Um, Yeah, I'm a terrible host. That's what I'm learning so far. I'm not used to doing this. I'm not used to being in this spot having to drive it. But uh, there's no real news today, although we did find out just before the show started, Danny. Speaking of going on trips, you've got a reason to go to Ireland. Florida State and Georgia Tech opening the 2024 season in Ireland. How much are the Knolls going to win that game by? And will Georgia Tech (laughs) even fly back to America afterwards? Uh, It better be by a lot, although they will be replacing a lot of talent that is supposed to be showcased this year. So, yeah, 2024 season. I think what better opportunity? You know, it's been a while since the Cover 3 pod has taken a road trip. Like what better opportunity than to kick off the season in Dublin and take in the Knowles? I mean, we got half the pod as Florida State guys with me and Bud. Mm -hmm. We have three ACC guys, and I'm sure you wouldn't mind like being that, you know, that um, bipartisan voice that just would not show the favoritism. You'd have no problem criticizing. So we need to be there. We need to be there from some pub in dublin or i don't even know where do they play that game um you're the soccer guy it has to be a soccer stadium right uh no it's actually going to be a rugby stadium Uh, although they might use it for soccer i don't know i know it's the aviva stadium i believe is what it is i think that's what it was when notre dame's been playing there it's uh i know they play rugby there i assume they play they soccer i don't know it's yeah i don't ireland has its own soccer league i would assume that they use it for that as well but rugby i think is a bigger sport in ireland overall I think it's Uh, cool. Like Jordan was like, why would you take that game? And you were like, one, it's a payday, but I think it's a good opportunity. Like for, as a player, I'd be fired up about it. You know, like you get to go uh, abroad, you get to see another country. A lot of these guys haven't had that opportunity yet. And a lot of guys do like to play on the national stage because you don't have that many opportunities in the regular season. And maybe there'll be another like game, but it's not going to be as high profile. I'm trying to think back to the Northwestern Nebraska game. I Still, when there may have been another game on, but like most of the eyeballs of everybody is going to be watching you, and it's phenomenal to you know just for the brand and for a, a payday. Yeah, because it's like it's a week zero game, so there are very few games that are on the schedule to begin with, and typically in week zero you see like Power Five team versus you know G five team or FCS team. It's like you got a twenty something point spread. But the game in Ireland is typically a conference game, or if it's Notre Dame, it's like Notre Dame versus one of its rivals, like Boston College. So it gets the big treatment from television. It gets its own spotlight. It's a big deal. And plus, a lot of coaches like Week Zero games simply because you get that extra buy during the regular season, which kind of helps with recruiting. You can you know, you know, can go visit some high schools on that weekend while everybody else is back coaching a game. But I do wonder if some of that is negated by the fact you have to fly back from ireland in that kind of trip i don't know i'd have we we should have some coaches on and ask them like pat fitzgerald and the notre dame staff like did that impact your season in any way like having to go to ireland to do all that while you're trying to prepare it'd be interesting to see (laughs) what they should blame everything on that that's what i'm saying yeah totally threw us off 
<laughs> so much so that we didn't win another game. That's like I would be I would be pulling that out at press conferences all year. It's like, you know, we're still a little jet lagged yes. <laughs> in the Ireland trip, which is why we lost to Kent State. So yeah, I mean that's a hundred percent what that was on. But uh no, that'll be fun. I, I think we should do more games in Ireland. I think we should do like just do like the NFL model. Like they've done it now where I think the Bears are England and Germany. Like they've assigned teams to countries. Jacksonville. Doesn't Jacksonville get London? Aren't they? Yeah. Well, is London, I know, because Shad Khan, the owner of the Jaguars, also owns Fulham, which is a soccer team based in London, and they've been playing a lot of games there. But they did it like the, the like they've got teams. I think, I think the Raiders get Mexico. Like there are certain teams that are allowed certain areas that they can kind of claim as their home territory. As the NFL is trying to expand into international markets, that's what the Cover Three should do, like you yeah. said. I don't. Well, I think I thought you were going to say Florida State. Florida State's tied to, I'll take Barcelona. That's where I will take. (laughs) (laughs) So true story. When I got into broadcasting, I I was out of the NFL for a few years, was trying to figure out what the heck to do with my life. And I was playing golf with a guy who was a producer of NFL Europe. And he was like, hey, he's like, uh, you know, have you ever thought about calling games? And I was like, eh, he's like, I think you should give it a try. And I was like, well, what do you got? He's like, oh, NFL Europe's going on. He's like, I think it'd be a pretty good pace, uh, place to get your feet wet and see if you like it. And I was like, oh, I was like, well, what game is it? He's like, Ryan Fire uh, at Barcelona. Play the, I think it was the Dragons, Barcelona mm-hmm. Dragons, if yep. I remember correctly. And I'm like, sweet. I'm like, free trip to Europe. Sign me up. I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. And he was like, we'll have your agent. I didn't even have an agent. He's like, have your agent call us. We'll figure out pay. I was like, who cares? Just give me the free trip to Barcelona and I'm in. So then I end up calling like the travel secretary and I'm living in South Florida and I had research flights to Barcelona and I'm figuring I got to get there three or four days ahead of time to prep. And the lady's like, wait a second. He didn't tell you. And I was like, tell me what? And he goes, she goes, uh, this is a remote game. She's like, oh. You're from the NFL film studio in New Jersey. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. He left that detail out. So my first game, Charles Davis was the play-by-play. He was kind of you know, ex- experimenting with play-by-play. And me called a game from the NFL film studios in Cherry Hills, New Jersey, while I'm watching these beautiful scenic shots of Barcelona <laughs> beaches. Thinking, Man, that should have been me. But you know what? It did get my – I did jump into broadcasting after that. So there was a blessing in disguise, but not the trip to Barcelona. But let this be a lesson to Lamar Jackson, who I know is a listener, is listening to the show right now. Danny did not have an agent, did not get the information that it was going to be remote, committed to it. Lamar, this is what happens when you don't have an agent. They will take advantage of you and leave out key details. So just just advice to you there. Um, <laughs> now that would be – Barcelona is a gorgeous city. I would love to go to Barcelona. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, a lot of people call Cherry Hills the Barcelona of New England anyway, I, Joe Corsero. Sure, I definitely see it. A Jersey Shore. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, would you go to Barcelona to call a game? Yes, that is the first question. But we will get to the mailbag now. We will start with two schools that are not located in Spain. But this one comes from the uh, five-star reviews, which, by the way, we're not strictly limiting all the questions today to five-star reviews, but it is and always has been the best way to get your question on the show. Leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We will get it. We will put it on the show. And you could say mean things about us just as long as you leave the five-star review. This one comes from Houston. What is the cap for Penn State and Washington? Both have been hidden and hindered by their division rivals. Is this the year they step out of their rival shadows or not? If not, why? Thanks. So I say for Washington, I like their chances better because of the conference they play in. There aren't like Penn State has two staples that are constantly at the top, at least in the last five or six years of the big 10, right? It's Ohio state and Michigan. So that's Mm -hmm. the question. Like can Penn state get past uh, Ohio state and Michigan? And while I think they could, and this year might be a really good opportunity to potentially do that, especially with Ohio state replacing CJ Stroud. And but I mean, they kind of been replacing quarterbacks without issue, but it is makes them a little bit more vulnerable, but I do think for Penn state, it's a lot harder. And with Penix coming back, who I thought had maybe one of the best seasons and biggest comeback stories, rejoining with Kalen Boer out there at Washington. 
building on a season, which I think is it safe to say Washington had the quietest 11 and two season of anybody. <laughs> in the country? Like, I mean, nobody yeah. brings it up. They're kind of an afterthought and they were spectacular. So Washington doesn't even that far to go. And I know Penn state only had uh, two losses as well, but I would say Washington because of the lack of consistency around the pac 12, like, yeah, USC was great this past season, but like, and Utah is probably the biggest hurdle because they've been the consistent winner. But I, I feel like the and the certainty of what Michael Penix is versus the unknown of Drew Alar kind of makes me more just more willing to go out on a limb for Washington as opposed to Penn State. Yeah, I, I I I have to agree with you on that one with Washington simply because I don't think the path is as difficult. So I, I do think Penn State, like Penn State was good last year, but Penn State is like it came off a few down years, but it is going to be just kind of stuck in the shadow of Ohio State and Michigan while they're winning the conference. But Penn State did win the Big Ten not too long ago. It was only a few years ago. Washington was in the college football playoff not too long ago. So I think it is very possible for both of them to step up. But I think Washington is probably your best bet this year because, like you were saying, with Kalen DeBoer there, Michael Penix, it was a very good team last season. They've got key players coming back. Oregon has lost some stuff in the coaching staff. You don't know what's going to happen there. They've lost a couple key players. USC is still, you know, Caleb Williams is going to make them really good no matter what they have. But that defense, we still have questions on that. We still need to see. So it is not out of line. And then, of course, as is always the case, we haven't even mentioned Utah. Pretty good team. Has been a good team for a while. They are not going anywhere either. So, yeah, it's not impossible. I don't think it's likely, but I think they're both going to be kind of 10 winish teams this year whether they win the conference get to the playoff that remains to be seen washington non-con they play michigan state which looks winnable i mean we'll see what mel tucker does if he can bounce back the you know usc utah who i think are their biggest oregon's at home so that's huge mm -hmm. uh usc on the road utah at home which i know usc had a great year last year but i think as far as environments you know, not only at altitude, but Utah Rice Echoes can get pretty loud. They can yes. that'd be a pretty tough place to go into. If you said, who would you rather have on the road? Who would you rather have at home? Like the schedule fits up nicely for Washington potentially this year to do it with the schedule. For sure. Um, next one from Rach09. Great work as always. Looking forward to all the off-season content. My question, with March Madness in full swing, how many Power 5 schools treat basketball as their top priority compared to football? Realistically, would a football-only conference like the Big East in basketball work for some teams? And which could you see – What could you? who could you see in that model? Which schools could you see following that model? So basically, who are the basketball schools? <laughs> and who are the schools that only care about football and field basketball teams and other teams because they have to? And is it possible for a football only conference? Um, I mean, I don't know if anybody, and if they do ignore football or don't take them seriously, they're doing themselves a serious disservice. And even look at the tussle that took place with Mark Stoops and John Calipari at Kentucky. Like, and Cal's like, hey, we're a basketball school. And Stoops is like, no, 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 wait a second. We all we bring a lot to the table as well because Kentucky would have been the first schools, one of the first schools as a basketball blue blood that I would have considered. Look at how much damage they've done in football, like, mm -hmm. and, and it does bring them a ton of value. So, I don't know, pure basketball power five school. Who do you think? I don't know. It's, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think, oh, God, Indiana, I think. It's had some success in recent years, but I think if you're being honest, Indiana is a basketball school. I think that Kentucky was a basketball school. But I think it's become more of a football school in recent years. And because like you mentioned with the fighting, but I don't know, like, I feel like the basketball schools that genuinely existed, kind of what you were getting at, they kind of left and they went and did their own thing and they're not really moving on to football i think that the more you see is genu genuinely moving towards football because that is where the money is you know coming from and like you think of the quote-unquote traditional basketball schools like indiana duke louisville all these schools that you would have thought of they've all improved in football in recent years and they've all kind of started investing a little bit more into the program now 
they're not exactly investing into it the same way like you know your alabamas and your georgias and your true kind of football schools are but they all have begun that process i'll even use my own illinois illinois is a school that for a very long time has been a basketball school the fans cared more about basketball the region cared more about basketball than football but under its new current kind of leadership football has taken on a bigger role there's been more focus put on putting money in the football program and you're already seeing the results of that on the field so i think the basketball school in the traditional sense which is like thinking of like the question asked about like the big east where you think of your marquettes and your georgetowns and your creightons and all those kind of schools i think that the future is more likely to see a lot less of that I think football is going to become important to everybody and for the schools that kind of get left behind in realignment, maybe that kind of becomes a basketball. As for the idea, could we see a football only conference? I think we kind of do already. I mean, well, which one? I'm not saying that. Oh, not, you're saying we just see the priority on football. Yeah. Like, I do oh. think. So here's one of the things that concerns me about the future. If we're paying you know, football players and we're paying them. Are there some schools that don't care about basketball? And they're like, you know what? If we're going to have to pay our football players, we'll save the money. And we want to go in on football because we know how much revenue it brings to us. Then maybe we, maybe we shut down our basketball program or we make it a club team or something like I still, I'm still open to a lot of different things that could be potentially on the table that we don't even think about because it is going to change the, the model it's going to change things financially for a lot of schools and if if you want to be competitive in the most uh you know fruitful you know financially rewarding sport that's out there it's football so you're going to put a lot more of your resources in there to be successful to try to stay relevant and try to stay in those top 40 50 programs where i think then you'd see the basketball programs fall by the wayside so if there was football only that to me does almost seem like an option i mean it's it's Armageddon. I hope we don't get there because I, mm-hmm. I love college basketball. I don't want to see it happen. I think, you know, what's interesting to me is the way NILs kind of change things or how it will change things because I think NIL is good for both college basketball and college football in that it's going to help keep some of the, the sports better players in school longer because maybe their pro dreams aren't going to be as guaranteed money as what they're looking at if they stay for another year in college. And I think we've already seen that at both basketball and football levels. But what I think is something that we're yet to see as much of, like the SEC did not care about basketball for a very long time. But then the TV money started getting to be so much that you could only put so much into your football facilities and your training regimens and like your gyms and all that kind of stuff. And there was still money left over. And we saw the SEC start putting more money in basketball. Like they started going after bigger name coaches to try to, you know, build up their programs. But now that NIL exists, will some of those schools pull back from basketball and say, well, why would we pay our basketball coach $5 million when maybe we can go get a quarterback? And not just going to use this example, Florida State, last few years, when the football program was down, Florida State's basketball program was really good. NIL comes in, that money that was maybe going towards the basketball program in recent years, now seems to be getting funneled into football and the basketball program is not having as much success. And I'm wondering if we're going to see more of that in the future. Don't forget. I mean, the SEC and big 10 such deep pockets and it's only, they're only getting deeper. They were spending money on baseball. I mean, they prided themselves in having the best baseball facilities, best baseball conference, women's sports. I mean, look at what they did with Kim Mulkey, bringing her in from Baylor saying, all right, they've had all this money to spend Basically, so it doesn't show up on the balance sheet. So there's not all this mm-hmm. extra money that you could be like, oh, that could go to the players. Once it does go to the players, I think it's going to be different. You know, the allocation of those funds is going to go more to football. So what kind of what are the secondary impacts on that? It's going to be fascinating to see how it unfolds. And right, we're going to go back to our talking about Barcelona earlier. There's a question from Robert Harrington in the live chat. What are your personal top two to three destinations? Factoring the factoring in the town, we usually go Thursday to Sunday. The game day atmosphere and the overall quality of play. One so is, jumps to the top for me right away. So this is bucket list like college football towns. Yeah, I have. What do you got? My number one that just comes to mind right because I haven't been there and I really want to go. Baton Rouge for an LSU game. I would love to spend a weekend in Baton Rouge for an LSU game. I, I think that has to be there. 
Top yeah, not three. a non-con game. I want it to be a conference game. It doesn't have to be Alabama. It doesn't have to be a huge game. I just want to be there for an SEC game. That yeah. would be one on my list. I think it has to be. Um, you know, I saw I saw Auburn on a list the other day. I think Auburn probably is one of the more underrated atmospheres in the SEC that doesn't get enough credit. Should we make this? Who are your top three in the SEC and top three out? Because I think all of ours might yeah. be in the SEC, and I want to make like I don't want to give them too much love because I would say Athens fits yeah. a lot of the the billing too. You know, great. It's easy access. It's only an hour hour. You know, short drive from Atlanta. It's a great college town. Quality of play doesn't get any better. Game day scenes phenomenal. Like those probably would be my top three in the SEC. And other, I've, I've mentioned this on the show, I, LSU would be number one. I think elsewhere in the SEC, uh, depending on what time of year it is, I wouldn't mind seeing a game in the swamp. I would not want to go early in the year when it is still no. like 95 degrees and 100% humidity. But once you get to November and things start cooling down, maybe I would go see a game there because that just kind of seems fun. Uh, South Carolina is a place that every time I see a South Carolina game at night, like especially when they're playing during the state fair and they've got like the whole – it's going on like right out, you know, by the stadium and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That looks like a really fun atmosphere. I think that was the Tennessee game this year that during that time, which did Jordan, correct me if I'm wrong. Did Tennessee win or lose that game? I do not remember. Hmm. <laughs> um, South Carolina outside the SEC. I want to go to a Rose Bowl, but I don't know if that counts for this question. Right. Um, so I got why. So I so I called a lot of those Big Ten noon games for a mm -hmm. while when I was at ESPN. There's some like Ann Arbor is a great college yes. town, and I'd go in October. Leaves are changing. Quality of football is great. Tailgating scene is great. It's not the most. It's not the craziest environment, but I think you just have to kind of take like that's where the SEC and like Baton Rouge and and Athens and all the all the SEC environments they are a little bit crazier and louder on game day. But Ann Arbor, they're a lot more prettier campuses than what you'll see there. I would now this one, this one I think is probably one of my favorite college campuses. And you could potentially see a number one overall pick, Chapel Hill. Now, game day environment, like again, it is kind of a basketball school. A Quality studious. of play is getting better, but it is fun. It's maybe one of the most picturesque campuses in the country. It is a pretty school. North Carolina is just a pretty state in general. Yeah. Um, Madison for a Wisconsin home game. Yeah, is I did, very I fun. There, that noon window, it's great. Yeah. great scene. Again, the, you don't want to go late. It's see, I do. November. That's see, that's what that's when the real men show up. Is when you show up in November and it's thirty some odd degrees and maybe there's some snow. Like M Madison is a great town in general. Probably yeah. not so much in January, February. Thankfully, the football season ends in November. Um, outside of that, Austin for a Texas game. More so for Austin. <laughs> yeah for the Texas game. <laughs> like the game would just be the thing you have to go to after spending three days at austin and then oh, where's my wood austin is a great atmosphere i was there for the texas lsu game and it was off the charts and they were a lot louder i mean people were talking about the bama game this year about how it might have been one of the loudest atmospheres and then you've got restaurants you've got music you've got you know everything you would want like i I am, it all comes down to your personality. Like, what do you like to do? Some people really like the small town college atmosphere. I totally mm -hmm. get that. I like the big city offerings with the college, you know, right there close by where you can walk a lot of places. So I, I'm, that's a good call there with Austin. Uh, you know, what's another one that's, it's picturesque. Now I know Seattle has some issues lately, yeah. but a Washington game, that stadium is gorgeous with the lake and they sailgate mm -hmm. out, uh, you know, in the end zone. It's loud too. quality of play. Like they get pretty loud out there in Seattle. So I'd say Washington, one of those sneaky, sneaky Pac-12 games. Rice Eccles, maybe one of the prettiest, but as long with BYU and Provo, Lavelle, like those are gorgeous stadiums. If we're giving our top two or three, it's turning into our top 20. <laughs> my, my there's last too many is, good ones right there's, there's, there's tons ones. of them that's what's great about this sport but like my last one and this is this is not because of Dion, because i've long been a colorado guy since i was a kid but i lo love folsom field i would love to go to a game at colorado i would love to see ralphie run onto the field and then just like the picturesque backdrop of you know the mountains you're in boulder so you're surrounded by mountains and so that would be a really cool place to sit, play or see and then also for the same reasons because like if you ever look at byu's lavelle edwards stadium it's got the mountains right behind it it looks like a very pretty place to go all so, right do you want to have uh 
Do you want to have some fun since yes. we're, we don't have no host? Bottom three. Oh, um, Rutgers. I've, I've called many a game in Piscataway, you know, the birthplace birthplace of college football. I'll just throw <laughs> that in the mix. We don't have to go ahead and crown them, but I'll say they're definitely a candidate. Miami. Ooh. Miami's another one because if you go to Miami, like you want to go to South Beach or you want to go to Coral Gables. Maybe you want to go to Fort Lauderdale, but guess what? The stadium isn't close to any of them. And it's a pro stadium. It's going to be half full. Like for that reason alone. And when your own quarterback says he doesn't like it, kind of have to take it, take it to task. Oh, wow. Um, (laughs) Purdue. I just, West West La- I've been to West Lafayette a number of times. I've, like, I had friends that went to school there while I was in school, and I would go visit. It's just it's a town that does absolutely nothing for me. Um, uh, where else? Houston. I would not like Houston to me is a very large city, and nothing. It has everything, but everything feels like it's twenty five minutes away. If that yeah. makes sense. So yeah. Houston would, is not I'm, Houston's not my I know the final four is there this year. Been to some events there. It's just way too spread out. Yeah, it's like a very large strip mall. And then let's see. God, what the th- bottom <laughs> just trash these teams. <laughs> Nevada. I'll tell you what. Have you ever been to Reno? Sure. What? Have you ever been to Reno? Nevada. <laughs> I've flown into Reno, but I quickly exited pretty <laughs> fast. I think that would probably be in my bottom three for sure. I did not consider many of the group of five schools. I could definitely come up with a quick top five, but we'll <laughs> we'll go ahead and leave that apart for our affiliation with Conference USA. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to give me emails. Um uh yeah, okay. So uh we should probably go to a break before Jordan yells at me. So coming up on the other side, one Kentucky fan wonders, is Devin Leary an upgrade on Will Levis or a downgrade? Ready? Go. Let the global games begin. This is the Challenge World Championship. Woo! March 8th, exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. 16 global MVPs are teaming up with challenge legends. Here come the big dogs! It's a very high level of competition. Who will be the champion of champions? The Challenge World Championship, streaming March 8th exclusively on Paramount+. Plus. Do you watch the challenge, Danny? I can't hear you. Danny's gone. Danny's mic is off. I can't hear Danny. Um, I'm just going to have to do the show on my own for the rest of the day. <laughs> What's going on? I can't hear Danny. Your mic's. This is this is what happens when Chip leaves. I should be good. I should be good. I, should <laughs> be good. Are. <laughs> I do not watch it. But if you tell me to, I did watch 1923, and it was great. I really? haven't watched. I haven't watched the new challenge on Paramount Plus. I'm a I'm an old school challenge guy. I've been watching it since the very beginning. It is America's fourth major sport, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> it's football, baseball, basketball, and the challenge. Um, <laughs> so I'm very much excited to be watching that new season. Uh, okay, so this question, going back to our mailbag here, comes from the the Apple Podcast reviews, a five star review from Drew B. Doobie Doo. <laughs> First of all, thanks for an awesome and hilarious podcast. Whenever I have whenever I have a flare up of my MS, I really look forward to new episodes that keep me entertained and give me a sense of normalcy. So I'm very appreciative of y'all for that. Thank you. Question. I know that Devin Leary in 2021 was more productive than Will Levis and has ever been that than Will Levis has ever been, but I can't help but feel that it's still a downgrade. Please convince me that I'm not crazy and that Kentucky can make a New Year's Six game this year. That last part feels yeah, like a stretch. Well, I cannot, yes, a bit of a stretch. You know, for Will Levis, like I, I feel like every time I talk about Will Levis, I feel like I'm ripping him to shreds. Mm-hmm. God, he was a good quarterback. Like he elevated Kentucky's play. What irritates me is when we talk about him as a top five pick. Like, I just don't think he belongs in that conversation. But, like, he was pretty good. I mean, two years ago, he was great. And, and the thing that also gets me, too, statistically, he wasn't that much different either year. But, like, it's, oh, two years ago, he was great. I'm like, nah, it's like he was pretty much the same both years. Now, he might have been struggling with more injuries. 
I don't, I don't, I don't think it's an upgrade. I think it's an equivalent. It might look different. I liked him a lot. I liked Leary a lot two years ago, but what do you think? I think Devin Leary's not the physical traits that Will Levis is. Devin Leary does not have Will Levis's arm. Devin Leary is mobile. I don't think he's as athletic overall as Will Levis is, but I think that the one of the things that the scouts love about Levis is his arm strength. And I think that Levis, because of that arm strength, that too many times when things are breaking down, he just kind of has that kind of effort. I'm just going to chuck it as far as I can and see what happens. And it's like kind of a panic kind of deal situation. I think Devin Leary has less panic to his game. I think Devin Leary doesn't have the ceiling of Will Levis. He's not the overall kind of game changing kind of player, but I don't think Devin Leary's going to hurt you when things don't go wrong. I think he will take what's there. He does a better job of taking what's given. And that might be unfair to Levis because this year that offense was just schematically was weird. The offensive line was very bad. He did not have a lot of help. For and he did he played like he didn't have much help. So the situation for Leary will probably be better this year, and it might be an upgrade from that aspect. But I just think that I don't I don't think Devin Leary is as good of a quarterback NFL prospect as Will Levis either. I don't think he is going to be a huge upgrade for Kentucky's offense. I think the biggest upgrade for Kentucky's offense in 2023 will be at the offensive coordinator spot. And hopefully you get some improvement on an offensive line that genuinely, and we've brought this up many times, was very very not good last season so from those angles i think kentucky's offense will be better next year even if it did kind of downgrade a quarterback yeah i agree i like that assessment all right this is a live question from oh oh jj the real question is will nc state's offense be better offensively with brendan armstrong and robert and i than they were with devin leary and tim beck will that be better I don't know. Probably. Will it be more fun? Definitely. Will it be more pass happy? Yes. See, that's, that is the one interesting aspect about this to me, because we know what Robert and I wants to do based on what we've seen him do at Virginia and then what they were doing at Syracuse. But we've only seen Dave Doran with Tim Beck. And one of the interesting kind of subplots for me in 2023 is you think of what Coastal Carolina was with Jamie Chadwell, Tim Beck's going there. I want to see what that offense looks like when Tim Beck doesn't have Dave Doran looming over him. And I want to see what the NC State offense looks like when Robert and I has Dave Doran looming over him. Because we've talked about Mario Cristobal in this aspect a lot. Might Dave Doran have some of these tendencies himself where it's just kind of like, I want to run the ball, play defense, and good complementary football because it's worked for him. And we know when head coaches have a formula that works for them, they do not like to deviate from the script. But maybe Dave Doran realizes if they want to take that next step, they got to get more explosive on offense, you know, and maybe that maybe they do. But I, I, there's also, I totally understand what you're playing. You're saying, because, you know, it's great when you're scoring, but you can also go three and out really fast. And then your defense on the field, the whole game, and then you're not having the same success wins or losses but i think i mean when armstrong and i were together at virginia he was deep they had what they 400 plus yards yes. passing a game they led the country and it wasn't even close mm -hmm. and i would think do you think he'll have better weapons at nc state just i mean over recruiting and just overall player around him he'll have better I players than he had at virginia I mean, yeah, Virginia had some decent dudes on that offense. So, like, Keaton Thompson, Dentavian Wicks, they were good players at the receiver spot. I think you could probably have similar at NC State, maybe a little bit better. I think you probably have a better offensive line at NC State than you had at Virginia in those years. Although, I mean, although a team he was on that team. But overall, I never thought that line was spectacular. I thought they schemed around it a lot. So, maybe that helps in some aspects. It's NC State's going to be a really interesting team to follow in yeah. 2023 because of this. Uh Another question from the chat from Adam Souter. A fun one because of tourney season. Which college basketball coach would you feel like could be the best college football coach? Mm. I don't know. I feel like 
I want to lean towards like the Izzos and the guys who scream a lot. Like because, Bruce Pearl. <laughs> yeah, like guys who get really mad, I feel like could probably translate to football pretty well, you know, because you see it like you see on the sidelines. You see Nick Saban screaming and slamming his headset. So I want to see a coach like that. I think those would probably be the guys. I think I think the best coaches in college basketball would probably be the best suited to coach football. And I think it's the other way around because I just think that the best coaches, it's not just knowledge of the sport. It's knowledge of the people that you have working for you and how to communicate with them and how to motivate them. And I think a lot of that translates across all sports. So I just think, I think a lot of coaches could probably do both sports if they dedicated to it because it's more about their personalities and it is just, I know what the three technique is supposed to do if the guard is lined up here. You know what I mean? I think Coach K, if he wanted to come out of retirement and take a gig, I could see him being that he'd figure out, let me go hire the best people around me. Mm -hmm. And I, I actually got to see him like in a, closed setting talking to his team and he was giving like a motivational speech it was in new york city it was like a christmas classic or something like that and i came out of there i was like wow you know and i'd been in meeting you know been in rooms with coach bowden and you know mike shannon and other you know like hall of fame coaches and it was stirring and it was just a regular season game like he is a unbelievable motivator unbelievable per- people person like that's what i think crosses all sports you got to be a good people person you got to be able to know which buttons to push which to motivate i think coach k would would figure that out you know jay wright's another one like impressive as a human and he's doing a great job with the broadcasting now but like i think some of the guys that are just successful wherever they've been like they're successful for a reason and they might not do the x's and o's but they could figure it out Jay's cashing those commercial checks now, though. Like, I, that's what I noticed when I was watching the playing games last those night. Coach wow. K. Yeah, coach Jay K and Coach K, K are, in, they are They are in every other commercial. They're not coming back. <laughs> um, here's one from Twitter from Damon Hatter. <laughs> Who would win a cover three arm wrestling tournament? <laughs> that's a good one. I feel like I threw because we had the challenge from the uh, fellas at Unnecessary Roughness, mm-hmm. and I, I threw Chip under the bus. I was like, I don't know. I'm a little worried about Chip's matchup, whoever it might be. But I feel like I'd probably put him in the rear, right? Is that pretty safe to say? I mean, Chip is wiry. Chip is scrappy. Yeah. I'm not I'm not underestimating him, but I think in an arm wrestling tournament, I don't think he's beating the other three of us, no. Right. But I don't think I'm winning either because I'm not really – focusing on like lifting or strength lately i've been more cardio so i don't think my arm wrestling is really up there at the moment i think it would yeah. be you or bud yeah bud i just saw him in person he still looks like he's lifting a lot like he, yeah he might take home the crown uh who do you think would win in a slap fighting contest who has the toughest jaw oh i could take a punch this yeah. I've, I've i've taken many <laughs> I, I could i could take a punch i think i would have a pretty good shot in the slap fighting contest yeah i think you'd probably win too <laughs> see and that's why unnecessary roughness i mean you guys we would stomp you because you just yeah. beat me for hours i'm not going down i'll be there at the end i'll take you out at the end yeah. and also by the way the best part of your appearance on that show was when we were talking about it in the group chat and chip asked who's brandon walker <laughs> That was, was kind of messed up. I think Brandon has returned us the favor at other times live on yes. the show. So yes. who's, who's Pretends he doesn't know pod. who we are. Yeah. Who's the who cover three guys? podcast? But Chip, <laughs> Chip generally didn't know. Sorry, Brandon. Chip has no idea who you are. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we'll go back to the actual questions. Uh, this one comes from MN House. Love the pod. Been listening since the Barton days. When Vandy wins, we all win. The future Big Ten schedules episode convinced me that the only interesting part of the California schools joining the conference will be the Ohio State versus USC matchup, which could have been accomplished with some home-and-home non-conference games. There could be other great matchups, but the fear of making schedules too difficult leaves us with a bunch of UCLA-USC games versus mediocre Big Ten teams. Remind me why this is better for fans again. I'd rather watch UCLA versus Oregon, Utah, Arizona State than UCLA versus Northwestern. Did anybody say it was good for fans? It's not good for fans. (laughs) No, I mean, that's just, 
the reality is this was all about the money and all about getting a bigger TV deal. And the fans are the biggest losers, especially Pac-12 fans. Mm -hmm. I think if you're the Big Ten, you're kind of like, oh, this would be exciting. Like, this would be an opportunity to have some new teams in there. But the Pac-12, which sure appears like it's on life support, it's brutal for them. Like, I hate it from that aspect because the fans are the biggest losers. And let's say you were one, like, in the SEC or ACC or Big Ten now, you got a chance. Like, you can go say, you know what, I'm going to, this year, I'm going to watch my team on the road. Or over the next five years, I want to check out every stadium in our conference and watch a road game. And you know what you can do? You can probably drive to most of those schools. But you're not going to be able to do that. If you're a, Good luck if you're a UCSC or UCLA fan. And if you want to do it from the Big Ten, you got to fly out to the West Coast. So it's it was never about the fans, and they're the fans are going to be the biggest losers. Uh, yeah, it's, it's about money. And it, I, I agree with you. Like, I would rather watch UCLA play the teams UCLA has always played than UCLA play Northwestern or Rutgers or Maryland. Because just as a Big Ten fan, like, I accept – like, Nebraska, I kind of accepted into the conference pretty quickly just because it did feel natural. Penn State's been in the conference since I was a kid, so that's never been anything but normal to me. But Maryland and Rutgers, it's like I know that they're in the Big Ten and I understand that they're in the Big Ten, but it still doesn't – really feel like when i'm watching illinois play maryland it's like it still feels like a non-conference game to me yeah and it's probably going to be that way with usc and ucla for a very long time you know what i miss too is i miss the or i will miss like different regions of the country different conferences have different styles of play and it's always mm -hmm. been that way right i mean and it's always been an epic you know trash talk battle between the big 10 and the sec the big 10 is slow and big and the sec is fast and you know, and can, you know, hits hard or whatever, whatever, you know, perceptions of them are. And now you kind of lose some of that because what is USC and UCLA are going to morph into big 10 teams? No, but like, I kind of like when an entire conference, big 12 for a long time. Oh, they don't play any defense. They have these awesome offenses. Well, let's let their champion play our champion and see who comes out on top. Like I do. I like that aspect where there is some you know, uniqueness to the entirety of the conference kind of taking on, you know, their own styles. But now everyone's going to kind of be forced into be the same thing. Mm, yeah, no, 100%. Uh, coming up on the other side, what will break first? The blue chip ratio or a team that hasn't won a beat since the start of the BCS finally winning a national title after the break? At stake, the chance to put on the iconic green jacket. So golfers, are you ready? Go. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. Oh, I'm ready for the Masters. It's I'm funny. It's like Survivor. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm also ready for Survivor, but the Masters. Yeah. Just hearing Jim Nance talking about the Masters. It's funny because you finally get to March Madness, and it's like, all right, awesome. And then you start seeing the Masters commercials, and you're like, all right, let's just get to the Masters. <laughs> um, this one comes from Dakota Moyer. What will happen first? A team will break Bud's beloved blue chip ratio and win the national title, or a team that hasn't won since the start of the BCS will win a national title. Now, the BCS began in 1998 when Tennessee won a national title, which is probably, in retrospect, the biggest upset of all time. That is just something that will probably never happen again. So I think we should conclude. Should we include Tennessee in this question as a team that hasn't won? Ah. Uh. <laughs> No, but what do you think will happen first? Well, Bud's blue, and for those who don't know, the blue chip ratio is something Bud's worked on for years. Basically, every team that's won a national title has at least half of their roster is five or four star recruits. That's that's it. There, are, it's if you don't have that to this point, you have not been able in the modern recruiting era, as far as twenty four sevens rankings go, you have not been able to win a national title. TCU threatened it, right? Threatened to break the blue chip ratio model, yeah. and it, like, and then when they got close, <laughs> but they sure didn't. Move, they didn't get past that hump, like, and that's the very clear delineation to make. Because yeah, you can get to the playoff and maybe even win one there, but can you take down the team that's loaded? Like eighty five percent of the roster is four or five star talent. Wouldn't they be? Well, no. So since ninety eight. I think it'll clearly be that it'll be that that'll be the answer because one of those teams will recruit and get their roster up mm -hmm. above the chip ratio and then they'll be able to win a championship. That's what I was thinking too. I mean, first of all, I think if you look at the blue chip ratio and the teams that won't have one since 1998, they're kind of all the same team for the most yeah. part. But yeah. just like 
for the spirit of the question, I think it would, I'm with you. I think it would be a team that hasn't won since before the BCS simply because with the playoff expanding, more teams are going to have access to at least have a chance to win the national title. And I do think that, like I've mentioned many times, it's going to be harder to win the national title in an expanded playoff because we saw TCU get to the title game. It pulled the upset over Michigan, and then it got destroyed by Georgia, but it only had to win one game to get to that title game. The TCUs of the world, the teams that aren't supposed to win national titles, will now have to win three games, and they're going to be playing three teams who have the quote-unquote blue-chip ratio. So it is going to become far more difficult. You have to have the same kind of talent level to win three games like that in a row. So I do think it'll be a team that hasn't won since the start of the BCS, and that team will be Illinois. Um, (laughs) Do you have a hard out at at 11.55? Yeah, 56. So we'll make this the final question before we get out of here today. This is a good way to go out. Who is more likely to lose their job first because of scandal? Bobby Petrino or Hugh Freeze? That's from Andrew McClendon on Twitter. (laughs) Oh, oh my goodness. That is a good one. Um, You know what? Neither of them. They're going to lose their jobs for performance, not for scandal. Uh, have you seen what's going on in SEC basketball lately, folks? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think – I think the days of Bobby Petrino being fired for riding a motorcycle with a woman that wasn't his wife on it and Hugh Freeze being fired because of, you know, like texts on company phones to people he shouldn't have been texting are gone. Um, yeah. <laughs> You've set a standard now that is pretty low standard to just yeah. say, oh, well, he can win. And that's all. It just means more. <laughs> That's all yeah. that matters. It just means more. As long as you get those double. Like you're telling me Arkansas right now wouldn't say if they could go back in time, they would say, was it worth it? Like, do we need to take this moral stand and fire the coach or do we let him keep his job? They all day long are letting him keep his job. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, yeah, congrats to you, Chris Beard, on your new job at Ole Miss. Uh- How would, what would the, so like also, yeah, I don't want to go down. I don't want to start bashing people. <sighs> but I was going to say, if there is impropriety, like if it was cheating as far as paying players, that's all above board now. Like a lot of the stuff, mm-hmm. the benefits that Hugh Freeze was accused of um, still doesn't look great for the program, right? It's no. not exactly what you want to sell. But even now, a lot of those a lot of those transgressions just aren't as big of a deal. Yeah, it's it's money now. As long as you're winning and you can bring in money, it doesn't freaking matter anymore. Do we Uh, have uh, bonuses for the cover three? If we win the best sports podcast of the year award. Oh, thank you for bringing that up, Danny. I did it. Yes. Cover three is a finalist for the sports podcast awards, which we appreciate. So uh, we would like to win it because it helps boost our egos and our egos are all we got. So if you could vote for us, using the link in the description to the show we would really appreciate it and also if you haven't done so yet even though it is the end of the show like the video if you're watching on youtube subscribe to the channel if you're watching on youtube that way you'll be notified when we go live with our three times weekly shows or you know maybe sometimes an emergency podcast pops up due to breaking news which hopefully won't happen over the next four days because i'm going to be watching the ncaa tournament i don't know about you danny and then finally to tomorrow because of the NCAA tournament, because Chip is in Connecticut, because Bud is kind of on vac- Bud's on vacation this week. I don't know. I, I think I think yeah, Bud's Bud's on dad duty for the week. <laughs> so the NCAA tournament tomorrow, no show tomorrow. We're just going to be watching basketball. You should just be watching basketball too. Take the day off of work. We're taking it off. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> get your bracket in. Yes, get your bracket. In. And if you haven't joined our bracket pool cbssports.com slash cover three there's also the qr code on the screen you could scan that on your phone you can enter it in the pool there's still time it's up till you know game start tomorrow that's as late as you can arrive if you want to get into the pool i think we've got over a thousand something people in there already so i would go contrarian if you want to actually try to win it but uh yeah i think that's today's show chip hurry back (laughs) danny thank you you. did a phenomenal job great job filling in for chip Thank you. He's Danny Cannell. You can follow him on Twitter at Danny Cannell. I'm Tom Fernelli. You can follow me at Tom Fernelli. Danny, thank you very much.